uh, out here in Sheffield with Dominic Ingle uh, to catch up on the weekend's boxing. Um, but before we do that, Dom, I just want to speak to you about uh, a video that was put out from footballer Gary Neville uh, and Amir Khan talking about uh, the Kelbrook fight. Okay. Something to do with gloves. Uh, d help. First of all, did you watch the video? Glove gate, yeah, I did watch the video. Somebody sent me a link on social media and, and said, what do I think of this? And I just had to have a little chuckle to myself. So I'll just play the video. So the fight. I see. mean, not many people know this. And it, it was a smart move by Kel's team. So we were in the chain room. I said, listen, Kel can't wear them gloves because we've seen them gloves and you can't wear horse hair. So this horse hair, we'll pause on that bit. So obviously Amir said, you know, you guys were told about horse hair. Just explain your understanding of horse hair. Well, let's just go back right to the beginning of that statement that when he says we're in the changing room when we find out that Kel Brooks got gloves on with horse hair in. Um, he didn't find out in the changing room. He found out the night before. But what they did is, and we're talking about smart moves. Now, boxing's a bit like a game of chess before you actually get in the ring. And Khan's team thought they were smart by leaving it till the last minute, leaving it till the glove up time to say you can't wear those gloves, when in fact they knew the night before the gloves had got horse hair in. And people say, well, what's the problem with horse hair? There's not actually a problem with horse hair. But the reason the fight took so long to make between Corn and Kilbrook is because both legal teams were backwards and forwards with stipulations, more Corn stipulations on weight, rehydration, you know, gloves, all these things. And it went on so long that probably the beginning of the, you know, what was put in the beginning of the contract, they probably forgot. Now, my understanding is, is that in the contract, Corn stipulated or Corn's team stipulated that <clears throat> Kelbrook couldn't wear gloves with horse hair in. Now, back in the olden days, all gloves were just made of pure horse hair. So the packing could be moved around in the glove. Glove. Kel has custom made gloves from Fly Sport and he always has uh, a particular type of glove which has foam in but it's also got a layer of horsehair. Not makes much of a difference really, just a little bit a little bit hard, a little bit harder. So we did the we did the glove check the day before at the weigh-in. I've actually got a video of me checking the gloves. I was there, Corn was checking the gloves, he was checking our gloves, no problem. And there was three pairs of gloves. There was a pair of fight gloves and a pair, two pairs of spares. And then um, as we got to the arena, after about an hour being there, Robert Smith came into the, uh, the, 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 uh, the Boxing Board of Control General Secretary, came into the change room and said, we've got a problem. And I said, what's the problem, Robert? He said, <clears throat> corn's kicking off <clears throat> that there's horse hair in these gloves. And I said, and what? He said, well, I haven't, I haven't got a problem with that. But apparently they've got it in a contract that can't, Kel can't wear gloves with horse hair in. I went, well, we didn't know that, and Kel certainly didn't know that. So somewhere in just the, on that point, was it in the contract? That's 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 what Ben Shalom said. They because Ben Shalom had done, you know, was obviously privy to the contract. I wasn't, and said, and Ben Shalom came into the change and, and affirmed it later, confirmed it later on, that they can't, Kel can't box in gloves with horse hair in. But we only found out maybe an hour, an hour and a half before the fight. Robert Smith came to me and says, I'm the, I'm the general secretary and I'm saying you can wear them gloves. Is that, you know, just as an outsider, is that something you guys should have known or somebody should have told you guys and if they didn't, who, whose fault's that? Well, yeah, we should have known and Kel should have known, but Kel didn't negotiate the contract. His legal team and his manager negotiated the contract and that should have been, but they probably had no idea. And we, we can, we're, we're actually going to talk about a subject further down in this interview about people having no idea about boxing. But, you know, Kel just has his normal gloves. He always fights in them gloves. So, yeah, we should have known. So there was a big kickoff, and I said, we're not changing them gloves. Robert Smith said, no, you don't have to change them gloves. I'm in charge of this, you know, boxing match, and you can wear them gloves. And then Khan's team started, no, we're not boxing Kelbrook unless he changes those gloves. You know, we've, what they did is they, they got the spare pair of gloves off Robert Smith. They insisted, which they shouldn't have done, and they ripped them apart, and they got some horse hair in. And that's when they started kicking off. But that was on a Friday night. I believe it was on a Friday night. It might have been a Saturday morning, but it was well before the fight. So they kept it in the little locker bag, you know, a little secret here for the gamesmanship to pull out on the night to kind of derail Kelbrook. So there was a big hoo going on. There was people knocking on Kel's changing room. We had Ben Shalom coming in, various people, corn solicitor, trying to ruffle Kel's feathers. Oh, you know, if you don't change them gloves, everybody's going to get sued. It's going to be this fight. It's not going to go on. I went, we're not changing gloves. We're not changing them. If Corn wants to walk out to that arena 
I says, or he doesn't want to walk out to that arena. And his excuse is because Kill's got gloves on with Orsay. I says, well, that's going to be on him, in it? And he's probably going to get paid if he didn't fight or not. You know, so maybe he was looking for an excuse. But I said, we're not changing them gloves at all. I says, and when people ask why Corn didn't come out to face Kel, well, he got some horse hair in his gloves. He'll just get ridiculed, you know, for, what, for whatever it is. He's boxed loads of people with horse hair gloves. And then Robert Smith started to panic a bit. Uh, ben Shalom started to panic a bit. Adam Smith started to panic a bit. You know, this fight's not going to on. One of the biggest fights going on. But in the back of my mind, I always knew it wouldn't make a difference. Whether I'd Kelbrook had a pair of pillars on his hands, he'd have still knocked out Amir Khan. It would have probably taken a bit longer, but he still would have knocked him out. So we played the game, and Kel, you know, Stonefist says, trust me on this one, Kel. And I said to him, I'm going to walk out to that ring with these gloves on, what you can't wear. In fact, what they did is, the, the original gloves that Kel, Kel had, he couldn't wear them, so we found another pair of fly gloves, what didn't have horse hair in, but there was only one pair of them. And they insisted on ripping that pair apart to find there was horse hair in. But there wasn't any horse in this particular type because they, they, they don't make them within. But they weren't going to even risk that. Basically, what they were playing for is for Kel to wear the same gloves as Amir Khan. And Kel wore Amir Khan's spare gloves, which were ones to protect your hands. They're very heavily cushioned. Yeah, very heavily cushioned. So, but we had a problem. Now, I changed the gloves in the ring and everything. What's he doing? That's stupid. I'm going to ask you that. How, how can we change them? Because if you knew you was going to change them, why not do them? Because people are saying on the comms, though, they've not had time to do pad work on them. His timing might be off. Kel boxes in, you know, always box, he's boxing grants forever and a day. Yeah, they might have got slightly different padding in. And he doesn't face Kel Brook stuff like that. Kel would get in there and box in any old gloves if he had to. He just, if he's got a preference, he'll pick, pick what he wants to pick. Now, Kel knew what was going on. Kel knew what was going on. Now, imagine that you're stood outside Khan's changing room and, and they've told Kelbrook to change his gloves and Kelbrook starts to walk out to the fight with the gloves he's supposed to change. Someone's going to run back into Khan's changing room and go, he ain't changed his gloves. And Amir Khan's going to think, Phew, thank goodness for that, I don't have to fight him, I'm still getting paid. And he'll have come down, his adrenaline will have dropped. And they've already got the mindset on, we're not boxing there. You know, he's brought the contract, we're still getting paid, still getting paid. And then he's changing his gloves in the ring. You've got a fight. What's Amir Khan going to say then? He's not going to say, oh, no, I'm not fighting, because he's changed his gloves. So he's gone from being up there ready for the fight. I'm not fighting because he's not wearing the gloves. <sighs> I've got to fight. And you could see in his ring walk when he came out, he actually went the wrong way around to get into the ring. He was that disorientated and that flustered. Yeah? So it was worth changing the gloves just to that. And Kel knew what the plan was all along because... All these things have been done, fights before when Kel were boxing on small hole shows, all these little tricks, all these little things going off. People are pulling strokes left, right and centre in boxing, but people don't see it. But for Amir to try and explain it away like it was all Kel's fault, actually it was him who put most of the stipulations in the contract. Kel had to agree to more or less everything. And then that's the result of it and kind of then bounced it back onto us saying, oh, it was a smart move. Yeah, it was a smart move by us because we've been in boxing a long time. Oh, that's interesting. I wanted to get your uh, side of the story and that, but you know, obviously, at the end, the, they showed a lot of respect to each other. Are you aware if you know the respect is still ongoing between Amir and Kel? Have they ever spoken again since, or are they kind of like? I'm guessing Kel's got respect for him. Yeah, of course he has, because you know, I will tell you why Kel's got respect for him because he actually got in the ring for a fight, and who knows? You know, afterwards, Amir said. You know, when he got in the ring, you could see down one side of his back, he got all the cupping marks, which is a bit of a, a distress signal. Uh, and that's what you've got to give Amir respect for. At the end of the day, no matter how well his camp went or how it didn't go, he got in the ring, you know, after giving it the big one for years and years and years and years. And you've got to give him credit for that. Maybe it was for the money, but regardless of that fact, he's still got plenty. And, you know, he, he, he's a fight at the end of the day and he, he went through with it. And you've got to give him respect for that. And I think they talked once or twice afterwards and then they've moved on. And, and that's what you've got to respect him for. He, you know, he did actually step in the ring where so many people talk up a great fight and they never fight the, the people supposed to. So, you know, he, they gave the fans of boxing what they wanted to see. And, and regardless of the outcome of the win, whichever it would have, would have been, it was a great spectacle. I mean, I haven't seen a, a show on Sky since that February. What's come anywhere near? All right, they got the Anthony Joshua one, 
over in, uh, in the Emirates. Yeah, um, but what a spectacle that was! Uh, uh, and people were saying they were both faded fighters and and whatever. But it was a great spectacle. You were there, I was there. Well, I believe you were there, and it was a great night. And even now, months after, people come up to me in the street saying, "Oh, what a fantastic fight! I'm glad they got it on." And you know, they still got a lot of praise from Amir Khan. They did. Um, you know, so it, it kind of satisfied the boxing community. Cheers, Tom. I just want to quickly get your uh, views on the, the weekend's boxing. Um, obviously, there were a lot of uh, talk about matchmaking, etc. Obviously, you've got a lot of experience in it. I know your brother John deals with a lot of the matchmaking as well. So, obviously, you saw Fraser Clark's fight. Um, ben Shalom was obviously questioned about it after the, after the event, and he kind of blamed you know Fraser's team. Um, but from your experience, where, where does the blame lie when it comes to matching a, a young prospect? Well, I don't want to call him a young prospect because because he's an Olympian. But you tell me. Well, you know, you've got to have faith in the fight that you've, you've got. And Fraser Clark can obviously fight. You know, he can. He's a good kid. And sometimes there's people who are looking after you. And I think, I believe in his case, he's got an agency uh, making the decisions. Now, unless you've got somebody with a boxing brain in that agency who's been in the game, like a former matchmaker, a former pro, a former fighter, you know, somebody who's been in the game for a long time, putting in... Putting somebody in charge of your career who de who's dealing with numbers and what your social media presence is and best deals, when realistically the bread and butter of the game is being able to fight and matching the fighters competitively so they can gain experience, they can be slightly tested and you know they can improve on the way up. And what you find is they've invested that heavily in these fighters, these agencies who deal with them, that... In order to get the return, they've got to get them through to a certain level and they can't afford any slip-ups. But realistically, it's a bad move because they could be giving them padded fights all the way up to a big fight and then get beat up in the main fight and they're never going to make their investment. You've got to, you know, fighters thrive on challenge and, you know, there was no challenge in that fight for Fraser and I can understand after the weeks and months of preparation in putting it in, to blow somebody over with a, a couple of shots is not what you're actually training for. You've got to be slightly tested, just enough. You've got to be competitive. So you've got people making decisions, really, with no experience. And that's why, back in the day, managers now are getting replaced by agencies. Trainers are getting replaced by pad men. You understand? And fighters are dealing directly with promoters. We're probably promoting another fighter who they might be fighting down the line. So where, you know, it's like kind of monopoly thing. So where, where's, where's the fighter standing all this? Where are, they getting, where are they getting the impartial advice? They're not. They're not getting it. And people are making decisions from really who haven't got the experience to make decisions. And, and, and you know, Fraser's not a, a young book anymore. Um, he, he hasn't got a lot of time in the game. He's got a good five, six, seven years or whatever. And he's got to be, he's got to be moved along very steadily, but competitively, where he's going to create interest. And who's going to be interested in that fight? You can't blame him because he's the fighter. And a lot of time, these decisions are actually kept away from the fighter. Do you understand? They're kept away from the fighter. Somebody's making that, you know, the, the, the person who's training want to look good so they don't want the get, kid getting beat. The person who's managing the career want to look good because we've done this for them. And, and that lures in other fighters. But realistically, you know what I mean? You can't beat uh, the, the matchmakers of yesteryear and the managers and the trainers who've been in the game for a long, long time who, who've got the experience of matching kids carefully. You know, give them enough of a test to bring them through and the experience, but, but moving them further up ladders as they go along. Instead of boxing a load of kids, you know, we're not going to stand up to anything. That's not a, that's not a fight. Obviously, Ben Shalom got the flack for it, obviously, live on Sky, because people assume he's a promoter, he's, he's behind it all. But where, where do you think the ultimate responsibility uh, lies? Because obviously you've got Ben who's paying the wages, promoting it, and then you've probably got a matchmaker who's found the opponent, and then the matchmaker, I believe, is showing the opponent to the trainer and, and his team, and then eventually the decision ma is made. So who do you think the ultimate responsibility lies with? Um, well, you know, Ben Shalom's a promoter, uh, he's, he's dealing with the management team and so realistically it's the management team, isn't it? That's what it is because at the end of the day, Ben's trying to build, build up the channel, he's trying to build Sky back up and he's probably finding it very difficult because he's probably got his hands behind his back, you know, as in, as in the calm fight where to make that fight you're having to jump through loops. Uh, jump through hoops and bend over backwards and realistically at the stage where Fraser's at he shouldn't be having to do that they've given him the platform to perform on and then they're not giving him the challenges and, and his team you know he's got to have more confidence in him and if he doesn't you know beat somebody who's you know 
a little bit competitive, then realistically, there's no, there's not, it's not worth investing in him, because somewhere down the line, he's going to come up short. He's going to come up short, and then there's no, there's no, no return on your money. You're not going to get a return on your money boxing a load of bums all the way through your career and then boxing in a, in a decent fight because first of all you're not going to grow a following from that you know what I mean? you're not going to attract an audience knocking over bums or, or kids who can't have a fight and then the first time you come to a british title fight or you come to a european you're going to get beat that's the, that's the end of it and i'll go back again way back to audley harrison when he you know it was in the olympics and you know he got his medal or whatever he did he got his own deal with bbc and a similar kind of thing, he had people picking his fights and making decisions. And really, what did he amount to at the end of it all? He had, his, he, had he ruined that. He ruined it, or his team ruined it, or whatever he did. They had a, I don't know, a couple of million pound contract with the BBC. And they had total control of what they were doing. And people lost interest in him. And then he, I think he went over to Sky, and then he never, he never fulfilled his, you know, his ambition or whatever it was. So that's what we're talking about 15 years ago, and it's, it repeats itself again. If you, if you haven't got the ability, Fraser has got ability, to be honest, and, you know, he's a good kid, but you might not see it because people are handling him too carefully, and he probably doesn't want to be handled that careful, and, and maybe he's got to have a say in it as well, you know, who he's boxing, and after that fight, he probably will do, he'll probably, somebody's going to get you know, pulled up and, and the questions have got to be asked because he's not going to want to keep going out and doing that because he will get the flag. Yeah, Ben will get the flag. He will get the flag. The management team won't get the flag and it's probably them who's making the decision. I might be wrong, but that's generally how it is. There's probably five people in that management team all getting a, a wage out of what he's doing. Whereas back in the days, the manager's on 25%. You understand? So, you know, people are getting replaced who shouldn't really be getting replaced, but that's how boxing is these days. It's, it's all changed over the years. You know, uh, people really are getting control of it who haven't really got an idea. Interesting viewpoints there. And, and to be fair, Ben Shalom did come out and uh, he, he, he was quite open about it and he did say it's the management team, not, not my decision. Um, just want to wrap up and ask you about the big fight this weekend. We've got an all-women's card. Uh, I know you and Peter Fury, you do share similar opinions. Uh, he's charged. Uh, Savannah Marshall has got a, a big test against Clarissa Shields. How do you see the fight going? You know, it's a good fight. I mean, Clarissa's a good boxer. Um, she's she's boxed over here. It's always get heated. I know she beat her in the amateurs. Uh, and I just I saw a clip of Nicola Adams uh, doing a little interview saying that you know, Marsh Savannah comprehensively beat her. And you know, she she she's obviously improved Clarissa Shields. And you can't really go on what's happened in the amateurs to what translates into the pros. But Savannah Marshall, she's a blooming unit. She's massive. She's strong, and. You know, she's got a good trainer in Peter Fury. He, he, he deals with the heavier fighters and, and she's done really well under him and probably because, you know, so to speak, he's not blowing smoke up her whichever way it is. He's telling her as it is because he's a straight-talking fella. And so she's levelled and grounded and she's not, um, you know, thinking that she's better than she is. He's got a good idea how to weigh up the opponent. And a lot of people have said to me that, you know, uh, Clarissa Shields is just, you know, beating people steadily. She's not doing anything, you know, to look too impressive to get that fight. So, and then she's going to unleash it on, uh, on, on Savannah. But I'm not so sure. But when I've watched, I've watched them both, I just think that Savannah punches harder. She's bigger. She's got a longer reach. And I just think, you know, Clarissa, she does talk well. And she'd have to be, she's going to have to be very smart, lots of movement, be out of the way. Uh, to, to beat Savannah and, and Savannah's going to have to obviously you know have done her own work and realise she can't just rest on the laurels of that last win and think well you know I'll beat her before I'll beat her again so it's an interesting fight um, I don't think it's as uh, as clear cut it could, it could go either way it just depends and like I always say with fights she'll know in the first couple of rounds which way it's going to go Clarissa's got to be boxing she's got to be smart and Savannah's got to close her down and start you know using her power and put the pressure on her Sound uh and what's your views on Peter Fury as a, as a trainer and uh, just as a boxing man? Well, he's been around a long time and he's dealt with Tyson. You know, he was in the corner when Tyson beat Klitschko. And, you know, Tyson's... The thing is with Tyson, look, my, my honest opinion is that he's been around boxing for that long. He's learned... There's, there's very few fighters, I think, in boxing who are very good learners. Floyd Mayweather's one, Tyson's another. There are ones, there are other ones, but they're, they're the two that stand out to me. But... As long as they've got somebody who can keep them on track, tell them where they're going slightly wrong, they'll do the rest themselves. And, you know, you, you'll, because sometimes you do get carried away with yourself as a box, thinking, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. Now, it's, it's managing to control the fighter. And I think in the early days, 
Tyson was very difficult to control. You know, obviously he's, he's tidied his game up a lot, and, and that's where he's got where he's got. And, and Peter was part of that before that. His brother U, uh, Huey was training. He came down to this gym, this sport here, loads of times. Tyson, so you see it firsthand. And then Peter got involved, and his dad, and, and Tyson's matured as a fighter. But you know, you, you think about it. Uh, his own son, Huey Fury, a uh, very good boxer, um, you know, and he's got Savannah, he's done a bit with Tyson, so he's selective what he does, and I think he's got a particular style, it's the hit and not get hit style, he's, he's defensively minded, he's, he's, got, he's also teaching boxing, not just fighting, he's thinking about defence as well as attack, and, and a lot of trainers don't, he's got a lot of experience, you know, he's been around boxing a long time in the background, so to speak, and he, he'll sit back and analyse things, and that's what you've got to do in boxing, instead of getting carried away with all the hype, somebody's got to keep your feet on the ground as a boxer, and I think Peter does that very well, because he's straight talking, I've met him a few times, I've known him over the years, back, back in the day when my dad was going over to Manchester to the Anglo-American and sporting club, so they've been around for a long time. He's a, he's a colourful character, he's got a lot of experience in life, and that's sometimes what you need with young fighters coming through somebody to keep you grounded and, and keep your feet on the ground uh, instead of like telling them they're fantastic and just telling them, Oh, you keep doing what you're doing. You've got to have an objective point of view, and I think Peter's got that, so he's not always going to be telling them, Oh, you know, you're fantastic, you're brilliant. He'll be saying, You know what, you're doing this wrong, stop doing that, do this. And he would probably be forceful in that way, and they'll listen. That's probably why she's done so well. So, yeah, he's, a, he's, a, he's an old school trainer, isn't he? You know what I mean? He's, he's not been around for a long time in, in, in the boxing game, really, compared to a lot of people, but he's been in the background watching and observing and probably doing bits what nobody's seen. Nobody's seen. Do you rate Peter over, you know, like you refer to people as, as the modern day Padman? Do, do you prefer Peter's style of training over, over that? Over what? Uh, you know, the modern day Padman, well, as you tell call me, him. Tell me, who would you want to name? I don't, you, you tell me. Listen, pads is, there's people who can do pads ten times better than me and it looks flashing, there's all these moves, but you try and put that into a fight. You know, like I say, I always refer to Floyd Mayweather's pad style, you know, you're hitting the pads, he's talking away, he's doing all this combination, it's automatic. And that's impressive. Until you go to his gym and you can see 10-year-olds doing it, 12-year-olds doing it, 16-year-olds doing it, and then his uncle who's passed away, I'll charge $50, I'll show you how to do it. And you, if you stay there long enough, he could do it, Luca. So it's a thing you can learn. So, but in, in a fight, does he ever throw that shot? No, he doesn't. So there's all these fancy moves, but you've got to know why you're throwing shots. So, the, 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 listen, there's, there's, there's fours and against, but... You know, when you think about in boxing, like we're talking, I think Johnny Nelson did an interview the other day, said there's no old school fight, trainers left. And if you're looking back now, you've got Joe Gallagher, who's been around a long time. There's me, I've been around a long time. I've been in boxing since I was 18, I'm 55. Uh, so I'm probably one of the oldest trainers. You've got, uh, who else have you got? There's other ones who probably don't get, you know, uh, up to the podium too much but they're doing a lot of good work in the background and, they, and they're waiting for the kids to come through but the ones that you're seeing on social media and on TV the ones who are getting all the accolades there are a lot of younger guys coming through yeah they might have got the pad work and they might have you know been in this fella's corner and that, but boxing is down to experience and experience of situations and that's where it is and Peter's probably got that so you know, I'd rather have somebody who's experienced, who's lived life and been through various situations than somebody who's yet to do that, but they think they know it all. And there's a lot of them. You know, there's a lot of them. There's, you know, I get people online, 20-year-olds, telling me, you know, you're lifting that dumbbell wrong and you're squatting wrong and that pad work's not particularly good and your arms are too this and you're doing this and it. Well, yeah, maybe so. But the, the, Dare I ask you who these trainers are that you've got in your mind? I don't, do you know what? I don't particularly look at any of the trainers. You know, everybody's good. If they're having success what they're doing, they're having success what they're doing. And that's it. And you, so you can't, you can't really be picking stuff off because I'm not particularly interested in what anybody else is doing. I'm only interested in what I'm doing. I don't look at anybody else and want to copy anybody else's style or whatever. You know, just like me, you have really good wins. You know, you have really good... And you get losses. And there's not a trainer alive, you know, who's got an 100% win record because it doesn't come down to the trainer. But ultimately, when it comes down to it, you can condition a fight in a certain way. When they're stepping that ring, it's down to them. You can't do the fighting for them, and it's a good job you can't because, you know, they can all fight better than the trainers. Do you understand? So... You know, there's no point. It's, I don't sit down and think, oh, that trainer's doing this. I'm not really interested in what they're doing. It's, it's what I'm interested in doing and what job I'm doing. You know, Peter's doing a good job over in Manchester. Joe Gallagher's, Joe Gallagher's doing an excellent job over the years. The, thing, the difference with a lot of trainers is Joe Gallagher cares about the fighters. Peter Fury cares about the fighters. Some, some trainers don't. They just sling them in, get the money, move on to the next one. There's loads. Everybody does it differently. But you've got to think of the long-term goal. And we took kids from 
you know, 10, 11, 12, 15, 16, 17, 18, all the way through. They've done well. Some kids haven't done so well, but through the years, you know, we've had a very, very good uh, record of fighters coming through at various levels, British, European, Commonwealth, world, all that kind of stuff. So it kind of speaks for itself, but, you know, whether that carries on or it doesn't, is to, to do with the fighters that are coming through uh, is, are them fighters coming through? Or are them kids coming through anymore who want to box? There's so many more things like the thing now to be a YouTuber. So there's the, there's less kids wanting to come through. So it's getting difficult. It's getting more difficult. And the, and the the problem now what's going to be facing Sky is there's no, you know, they're all at first base. All the fighters they've got more or less are all at first base. And really they want to be getting to fourth base and a home run. And it's going to take so much building. Like as I said in a previous interview, you know, all right, they managed to pull the, the AJ fight out. But who's coming through at the minute? They've got all these prospects on the, on the, on the ladder and it's either going to be a slow build so they're going to do something in a three or four years' time or they're going to try and chuck them in too deep and then they're never going to get the experience they need to compete at the bigger level. You look at Tyson's early fight, fights, you look at Cole Frutcher's early fights, you look at a lot of kids' early fights, they're not great. You know, they're knocking over stiffs and then they have a bit more stiff competition, but eventually they build and build and then they build into podium fighters, stadium fighters, uh, and it takes off. But the, you could back in them days because there were so many kids coming through, but now it's very limited what's coming through. So, you know, you've got to be providing Sky, you've got to provide in the zone with exciting fights. And unfortunately, there's not enough exciting fighters coming through who are ready to take that big step. Definitely. Um, I appreciate your, your words, Dom. Um, Thank you. We'll, we'll catch up next week for uh, Fight Week for Barry and uh, Maxi Hughes. Yeah.